I wanted to start with a hysterical um, example of my view on social media and how nobody knows anything about what they're doing and why trying to figure out how to get good at social media is a complete waste of time. So you're going to laugh so much when you see this. I'm going to share sound just in case something comes up now that I know how to do it. All right, here. Look at this. Two days ago, I had a conversation about a friend with Tom from MySpace. And so I made this tweet in the morning and I hit enter and I didn't think anything about it. And I had my first like, mega viral tweet without any preparation, Wait, absolutely no what? intention to do it. I just posted a picture about Tom from MySpace. I, I wrote, shout out to Tom from MySpace. He sold his company and basically disappeared from the internet. No drama, no new startup every year, no flashy social media feed. Got to respect that. Half a million views, 4,600 likes at this point, 200, basically 330 something retweets, 54 of them were quote retweets. And I mean, I think I got 150 new email subscribers from this. So like, <laughs> congratulations to me, my most viral tweet. And by the way, um, LinkedIn as well. I'm at about like 3000 likes right now. On, LinkedIn. on the same thing on the same post yeah what that's <laughs> wild <laughs> congratulations man any sense social media doesn't make any sense how in the hell is this the most successful thing i've ever posted in my life on social media and i i didn't i forgot that i even posted it that's how little like preparation went into it i just wrote it i hit enter on hype fury it scheduled it to post it whenever it wanted to and then, you know, today's the 24th, I, this was on the 23rd. And so last night, I look at it. <laughs> Holy shit, Tom from MySpace is like, blowing up, man. He's, he's a rock star. Do you have any insight into why this is working? Like, nope. I know you kind of set this up with nobody knows anything. But did somebody did Elon retweet this? Is Tom out there pulling levers at Twitter? Nope. Like what's going on? No, nope, here's oh. here's the biggest bump I got from it. And so it's it's this handle called Greg. He's like this hysterical parody account. Greg Greg 166-7693-5420. I know that sounds like one of those Twitter bots, but he's actually like a really popular Twitter handle. And it was only two hours ago that he commented on it. And it just says he's still among us at MySpace Tom. And and this was it. This was the biggest bump I've gotten. So other than that, it's it's just oh, <laughs> it's just like Twitter. <laughs> that's all it is. All right, that's the show, people. Shut it down. <laughs> Stop trying. <laughs> that's it. Stop trying. <laughs> yeah. Post random stuff. But I mean, seriously, I on my newsletter, um, I, I do a, a short, like three or four minute YouTube video on my newsletter every week, and so I had a video, and when I woke up. And I saw this because, you know, on Friday, I have to get my newsletter published uh, by seven mountain time. And I'm never even starting it when I wake up Friday morning. And so I had a video, but I saw this and I thought it was just such a great example. I did a really, really quick kind of selfie video on YouTube. And the message was, it, I'm not trying to make it seem like nobody knows anything like, yeah, that's a funny joke I've been talking about the last couple of weeks. There is strategy and there is tactics, but most importantly, just keep going because you just never know like that. That was the message of the video. And that's if there's an, an actual piece of tangible information to pull from that, like hysterical uh, little tangent I went to, it's that just keep going, keep making stuff because you just have no idea what's going to happen. I like that. It's funny that you shared this today. A friend of mine had something very similar happen to him yesterday, too. He had this uh, thread about a developer that he works with. I think it's like a contractor somewhere overseas. And this developer's been playing with GPT-4. And he basically programmed, he, I, he wrote some little script to scrape the top 3,000 um, Shopify accounts and then uses GPT-4, I, I don't even know how he does this, but basically uses 
information on their website to teach GPT-4 what the company does. And then the GPT-4 will pitch an app for the company based on what they do. Wow. And then it will cold email the company with the app pitch. And I think it even, Codes it may app. even reply. Yeah. So the, basically this developer sent out 3000 cold emails to the top Shopify stores in the world yesterday without seeing any of them. He hasn't read any of them. He doesn't even know what GPT-4 is pitching to these people <laughs> until they reply. And they're like, oh, your message was so funny when you said blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Would love to talk more. And that's when he first sees what the pitch is. So my buddy wrote this thread about the entire thing. And I saw it maybe like an hour or two after he posted it. And there was only, I think I was the, I'm going to, I'm going to claim this because I was the first person to like it. The thread didn't go anywhere. And then all of a sudden this morning, he hit up our group chat and he goes, well, this got away from me. And it's got, it's got similarly like a half a million views, 3000 mm -hmm. likes. He's got 3000 new followers on his Twitter account. And the thing is just absolutely blown up. So it's funny, just to your point, yeah. something, not only do you not know what's going to be popular, but sometimes it's a real sleeper. Like I, do you ever get into this where if you post something and it's not, it doesn't like take off immediately. You're like, ah, oh, that wasn't good. Sometimes you're tempted to pull it down. Uh, nope. It's like, leave it out there. You never know what's going to happen. Yeah. I love it. I love it. I knew that you would get a kick out of it. And especially of all things, Tom from MySpace, right? Like he's kind of like the social media anti-hero, the one that just said, this whole thing is rigged. I'm cashing out and traveling the world. And now he's just some kind of closet socialite that takes awesome pictures and like seems like he's living the best life ever. It was just too perfect not to share. I had to. I loved it. <laughs> cool, man. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I think that is pretty cool. Speaking of content. I would love to talk to you about something that I've been working on, something behind the scenes, something we haven't talked about on the show yet. Oh, I'm excited, man. There's been a few times when I almost slipped talking about it. There's been a few times I almost let the cat out of the bag. So I'm I'm relieved that this day has finally come and we can talk <laughs> about all your hard work. <laughs> it's been long enough, man. I feel like I'm in the exact same boat. So for people who don't know, the for the last six months or so, I've been working on the side with uh, Sam Parr's newest company. And we're talking about this Friday. The day this podcast comes out is the day that the company launches. So March 28th, it's all officially public. Um, but for people who don't know, Sam Parr, obviously the original founder of The Hustle and Trends. I've been working at The Hustle and Trends for years. Great newsletter company. That's where I really cut my teeth as a writer and really kind of figured out like how the the industry of professional writing works. Mm. Um, so the hustle was eventually acquired by HubSpot, had some great time there as well. Sam finished his run with them, started a new company. It's been in stealth ever since. And I've been helping on the side with some of their content and community building. And that is basically my official role now. So by the time people hear this, I'll have like two days left at HubSpot, really oh, excited wow. about so that's that's out there now too. We can talk about that. I mean, I think so. I I would assume so. <laughs> uh, I hope so. <laughs> um, but you know, great run there. Uh, cool team. Very excited about people stepping in to uh, continue running it. But I'll be moving over to this new company now full time, and I thought it would be fun to just talk through some of the stuff that we've done over the last couple of months because what this really is is this is. This is the very beginning of what's going to be a brand new paid community and probably, I mean, hopefully, a uh, media company. And so we've been working on both of them, obviously, with people who know a ton about the space. Thought it'd be just fun to unpack some of that stuff and go behind the scenes. So, yeah, does that sound cool? It sounds great. And by the way, I've seen the homepage of this business. And so if we talk about that copy, I have some. Uh, like personal familiarity with the homepage. Um, and I just dissected it and there were parts about it that I really loved. However, most of the stuff that you're going to show me, I've, I've never seen before. So to, to people that are hearing this for the first time, this is the first time I'm hearing it as well. So you're going to get like a real authentic reaction. Cool. Yeah. I, so 
actually wasn't planning to show the content, was just planning to kind of like talk through it more. It's fine. I figured we could start by talking about community stuff. This is something that we've uh, discussed on this show a couple of times. Uh, yeah, I'm excited to talk about this, man. So the name of the company is called Hampton. It's basically a peer group for founders. And I've been doing their community and content stuff for the last couple of months. And the reason I'm excited, or one of the reasons I'm excited about this is it's definitely like the highest level uh, community that I've ever helped manage before. It's pretty expensive. Um, and so there's going to be a lot of stuff that we can talk through here uh, that I think people who are currently building their own communities, their own paid communities, their own paid newsletters, stuff like that might transfer over. Why don't we start at the beginning? in terms of like how the community kind of got started, the origin story of the company, Sam will talk about that in his own time. Uh, but when they pulled me in, it was basically super early. And what I thought could be kind of interesting for listeners is like in the earliest days of a community, what is the main focus of a community manager? And like, how do you really kind of crank that wheel and get the people active? So happy to talk through that for a little bit. And then I'd love to just hear some of how you do this on Copy Blogger Academy too, because I think you guys are doing a great job of that too. Um, so for us over there, it really kind of came down to a couple of things. I think we may have talked about this before too, but it's like in the early, early days of a community, you really have to inject energy in order to get conversation going. A totally. lot of, yeah, a lot of people think if you just get a group of people together, they're going to naturally start talking. And that might happen sometimes, but what you really need is you got to kind of put energy into the equation in order to create the kind of outcome that you want. So um, when I came in, the basic sort of set of instructions that I had early on was, let's just make sure that every single day we are posting something in the community that's kind of interesting and engaging. So maybe something that people would like, or like a question that they would be willing to share their feedback on, stirring up conversation basically every single day. And then the other one or the other two were um, introducing new members to the group. So you shout out new members as they join, which makes the group feel really dynamic. You kind of like glow them up too, like make them seem really cool. So people are excited about the group that they're in. And then whenever people did post, my the third thing that I focused a lot on was um, hopping in really quick and tagging in other members of the group who might have opinions that could be helpful. It all sounds really basic. I'm basically just saying like you go to the group every single day, post something interesting, introduce new members, and make sure that anybody who has questions is getting connected with people in the group who can answer them. It's super basic, but it's unless you kind of like know to do it, I think it's easy to overlook that stuff and just assume the activity is going to follow. So that's kind of where we started. I have a question. The thing that I struggle with the most, which we've talked about before, and I've been very aware of it ever since we, we spoke about it, is your idea of introducing people to each other and tagging people. And it's not the, the mechanism of doing it is hard. You're, you're typing in a few keys and hitting the at sign. Like it, the work isn't hard. I want to know how your Matt, like, how do you keep track of the members and what they do and what they know and what they're interested in? Because I, I've, I've really struggled. <laughs> like, it's been hard. We're, we're almost to a thousand members now, um, and so I think to myself, oh, well, this like isn't possible. But then I remember, at, at Trends is like fifteen thousand members. I think more at this point, and I, I know that you guys do that. So. How the hell do you do it? Like, what's the technique? That's a great question. I have a couple of suggestions or like things that have really helped me. I can think of three off the top of my head. And then there's like a fourth one, which will probably come to me. But the, okay. First things first, I have a really good team on the back end that is screening a lot of these members as they come in the door. Right. So, uh, so for Hampton specifically, it's a, it's a, it's, you got to go through an interview process. It's a vetted community. So basically by the time somebody has gotten into the group, there's somebody on our team who knows what their deal is. They've sat down and had a pretty big conversation with them. We have notes on them in our CRM. Mm -hmm. um, and so 
by the nature of that, there's basically a record somewhere about what, like who this person is and what their deal is. That's kind of an extra advantage that maybe not every community would have, but I have that at my disposal for when I'm trying to find people, or even when I'm trying to introduce somebody to the group, I can go and like look look at their records to kind of understand a little bit about who they are. Now, let's assume that you don't have that because a lot of, a lot of communities aren't going to be that highly vetted. A couple of other things that I've done that have been really helpful along the way. Um, the first is we, uh, we're building a culture of like introducing yourself in the group. So we use Slack for our community. Every member who comes in is automatically added to our general channel and then our introductions channel. And they get messages from me automatically that encourage them to introduce themselves, right? So we've kind of been very particular about building a culture of like, hey, welcome in, make sure you introduce yourself. And in our case, um, again, because it's kind of like highly curated and it's pretty expensive, it grows slow enough that like individual introductions are possible. In a company like Trends, you might have 150 people sign up every single day. Wow. Um, which is, it's harder to, it's harder to introduce all those people. Um, but in communities that grow slower, you can be really purposeful about building this culture of saying like, hey, welcome to the group. Make sure you introduce yourself. And then again, like by leading as the community manager, you can um, tag other members on introductions and make sure that your members are rewarding new members who introduce themselves, right? So the, it just kind of creates this cascade of people wanting to introduce themselves because it's a nice experience and they see other people having a nice experience doing it. So we built this culture of introductions, which gives me more background information on our members. And then here's like a really um, concrete exercise that I do. And then now I'm encouraging one of our new hires to do. So we're actually bringing on another community lead at this point. Uh, I have a spreadsheet of all the members in the group and it stays automatically updated. I use Zapier to keep it automatically updated. Cool. Every time a new name hits that list, there's basically a few columns on that spreadsheet of different things that I like to do for that member. One is the introduction, like their introduction to the group. I track whether or not they've done that. Another would be highlighting them in one of our public channels. So like me introducing them to the group and I track whether or not that's happened. I track whether or not we highlight them in the newsletter. And then I'll write just a sentence or two about like their company and anything that they're trying to get out of the group. It's a really time consuming task, but so far it's the only way that I've found to develop like a deep enough understanding of the group to be able to very quickly recommend other members to new members as soon as they join. So for people who are listening to this and maybe want to replicate this themselves, the way to do it, and this is this is kind of the training exercise that I'm using to onboard a new community lead. Get the spreadsheet. For us, we have an introductions channel. The spreadsheet will have all the names of the community in it. And then there's a column with a checkbox that says this person either has introduced themselves or they, they haven't. And then there's a column that says, what is their business and what are they looking for? You have your new hire, take that spreadsheet, go through your entire introduction channel and fill it out. So what they do is they literally search for every single name on the sheet and they can just control F like copy paste the name. It'll take them right to the introduction if it's there. Fill in the information, become a little bit familiar with the member. And then what they'll have at the very end is a passing familiarity with the entire group, as well as a list of people who have not yet introduced themselves, right? And so now you have a group of people you can target in order to just like do that manual outreach and say, hey, you know, better late than never. It's great having you in here. We'd love to have you introduce yourself, make sure that everybody knows who you are. Yeah. But it's a super manual. I don't really think there is a way to automate a lot of that away. Well, well, actually, uh, let me walk that back for a second. There are things that you can do on top of that. And I'll, I'll list a couple of them in a second that can help scale this. But when it comes to whoever your community manager is, there is no replacement for somebody who has a super intimate understanding of who's actually in the group. For sure. That's a relief for me to hear that I'm not 
missing something like it there's no way around it other than to be very manual and i think the academy is probably a little bit more volume heavy than hampton so i've come up with other ways to do it which aren't quite as personalized but i, I feel pretty good about them and, and so here's what i've done i definitely automated the message that says, hey, welcome, I'm Tim, introduce yourself. And I would say there's like a 70% response rate to people introducing themselves. That's really interesting. I mean, I wonder if there's a way I can even automate it where it's like, you know, I don't, I don't think I could because there's no way I can trigger a zap that says like, if this person posted, then don't mess it. Maybe, maybe there is. I think I probably could do that through filters where if they didn't message, I'll send them a follow-up. If, if they didn't introduce themselves, I'll send them a follow-up message that says, hey, I noticed that you didn't introduce yourself yet. It's really important that we all get to know each other here. I'm going to do that, man. I think I can figure that out, actually. I think I can do it. We should actually, that's a great idea. We should, we, we maybe we should pull in, there's a guy on my team who's in charge of automations. He automates a whole bunch of stuff on the company. And one of the things he's been able to do is use a combination of chat GPT and Zapier to uh, figure out a lot of stuff. Like, like when people post their introductions, I get a bulleted summary of who it was that posted and like what the introduction, like just their cool. background. Yeah. Summarized by chat GPT. So it's, it's accurate. I've been really shocked at how accurate it is. It's good. It's a good summary. I still read the full introductions, to be honest, because I like I I like the little details that get kind of summarized away with stuff like that. But um, for a while, we were playing with something there where like it it is able to see who posts in main channels. So for Slack, that's one thing. For Circle, I'm not sure what the API looks there like there, but there are ways to track it. the The way it gets difficult though is whether or not the tech can tell the difference between introducing yourself or commenting on somebody else's introduction. Exactly. Yeah. But that's why I'm I'm hesitant about it because I know I can filter through when somebody makes a post. Like mm -hmm. I, I know that's an option in the in the API in Zapier. And so that's why I'm going to have to filter it where it's like if somebody makes a post, filter it through maybe the keyword introductions because we have an introduction channel as well. And so like I don't know if the Zapier filter will be able to recognize the channel name in terms of the filter, because usually it's, oh, you know what, but maybe, okay. So maybe what I could do is when people post stuff in introductions, I wonder if there's a way where I could force there to be like a hashtag introduction in the content that they actually post. So when the filter's running, the filter is going to scan the content. And so it's not necessarily going to scan the channel name. It's going to scan the content that they actually wrote. So I wonder if I could like, force the hashtag introduction onto that content. I think I can do it, man. That's a really good idea. Yeah. I think that could work. I think that could work. The other option, and this is sort of like the lazy writer's workaround is like, if you're just creative enough with how you do the follow-up in terms of how you word it, sometimes it doesn't even matter if they have yeah. actually yeah. posted. You're just like, <laughs> right. hey, how's things going or whatever, you know, like, <laughs> It can be, it can, that's, that's the, that's the non-technical workaround. Totally. It's like when you yeah. forget somebody's name in public and you're like, Hey, you, you know, what's going on, dude. Uh, there is a community manager version of that. Oh, sorry. It's fine. So let me tell you the other thing that I've done. There's the introduction, but I've also created a sequence of messages that give them exercises. Most of the people in the like they're they're going to be a different target demographic like the people in Hampton are already pretty successful they're not struggling with the idea generation phase they're more so in the probably like loneliness and isolation and like not having people that can relate to them with their day-to-day -day problems but so the people that i'm looking that are, are looking towards me for answers are usually i'd say in like the first third of their journey. And so I put together some exercises to get the juices flowing. And one of them is what I call the ultimate outcome. This was part of that Tony Robbins thing that I think we talked about before, where every decision that I make, does it get me closer to 
or further away from my ultimate outcome. And if it doesn't get me closer to my outcome, I don't do it. And I think for my members, some of the things they struggle with is they just start doing stuff because people tell them to do stuff, you know, like, oh, you just gotta, gotta put in the work. You just gotta start taking action. And like, yeah, you wanna have an action bias, of course, but I'm trying to get people to define their path and define specifically what it is that they're actually building towards. And so the next round of messages is defining their ultimate outcome. And then they post that and then other people comment on it. And then another message that goes about three days later is about um, like writing it down. And I, I use an old framework that I've talked about, like, what was it like? And then what happened? And what's it like now? So you, you define what your life is going to be through those three things after you do the work. So like, what happened? You know, what did you do? What's it like now? Which is, what is your life going to be like at this present moment after you've like done done these things? And those those exercises have basically um, forced not nah, forced isn't the right word. They've they've greatly encouraged engagement and conversation and vulnerability. I think most importantly, without me having to like be Johnny on the spot, responding to everything 24 seven. I like that a lot. What I hear when you say that is like, you're basically building culture around certain ideas. And that's, <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a whole other, um, you know, topic that I think is, is difficult. It's difficult for everybody. Um, especially if you are trying to do it for the first time, because it's a little bit less clear, like what, goes into creating culture, even for us. I mean, I've been doing community and content stuff for half a decade now, or I guess more than that, whatever, almost a decade. And um, it's still just complex. You know, you're like always kind of solving problems for the first time, um, even if you feel like you have a pretty good grasp on how things are supposed right. to go. That's such a good way to put it. You're always solving problems for the first time, no matter what. It's yeah. still like a daily thing where you're like, huh, never seen this one before. Exactly. Yeah. Cause people are so weird. Like everybody, everybody's <laughs> people will always surprise <laughs> right. you. Um, <laughs> a couple of, so I like, I like the way you're approaching this though. And I think that's useful for people, especially if you're talking like the things that a lot of our members build. So paid newsletters, things that grow yeah. probably a little bit faster. Um, I, I've been lucky to have access or to have access to a couple of other things that have helped with this too. So for anybody building on Slack, uh, we use a tool called Threado, which is really cool. It's a, it's a Slack. It's like a community management tool. Um, and specifically, I like it for two features. One is the automation. So a lot of our welcome flows are automated through Threado and it's, it's super easy to build them. I've been really happy with it. And the it's still like a small team. So they're pretty responsive if you have like feature requests and stuff. You mean the app um, team? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the other is, um, the other feature that I really like it for is you can use it to DM everybody at once. Cool. So it's not like an all channel message. It's an individualized message with the same content. That is really cool. Yeah, it is. You gotta be real careful with that. Uh, because, you know, obviously you're always sort of like, you're always, I don't know, walking a line with a community yeah. between being helpful and being irritating. Um, and, and if you're DMing people, you really like, it's gotta, you can't really fake personalized messages, you mm -hmm. know? So you gotta make sure that you're, if you're DMing people, it's done in a way that like, feels right but it's been super helpful we use that we use it pretty rarely for that but uh when you need something with like you really need people's eyes on something it's it's a great feature so thread has been one really cool tool the other couple of things that have helped um to kind of scale some of the community interaction uh have been i'll say maybe two things one is we keep an updated twitter list of all of our members and so i will What's that? That's a good idea. Do you manually add the people? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, we have a VA who does a great job of keeping that up to date. And uh, the community really likes it because they can follow it too. Cool. And so it, like, as soon as somebody new joins, they can see everybody who's in there. They can uh, follow the list if they want to. And then it helps me stay up to date on what's most important to like our members, right? So if like if somebody sells their company or if they launch a new product or any of that stuff, it all comes, they all talk about it on Twitter, right? So that is one of the ways that I stay kind of up to date. And if I'm, if you think back to this concept of like sharing stuff in the community thread and like getting people introduced to each other, and calling people out and stuff, that's a great way to do it. The other thing that I'll do is I love, do you ever use Feedly? Or other RSS readers? Oh, they're the RSS thing. Totally. Uh, I don't Ooh. use it anymore. Um, it's great. But basically what happened is as like the, the purpose of Feedly for me was to keep track of new articles and new content that I could share with people or that I could use to curate in my newsletter. And I found personally that just bookmarking stuff on Twitter was actually a lot easier mm -hmm. because as I, as I would find all new content, I would just bookmark it. And then when I was writing my newsletter, all of the stuff that I wanted to curate was already on there, but I have used Feedly before I developed like my own system. It's dope. Right on. Oh, that's, a, that's I get that too. Cause you're already scrolling Twitter most of the day, you know, yeah. these RSS readers are awesome though, dude. So you can subscribe to different blogs and stuff. So I'll, I'll subscribe to our members company site, RSS feeds and use that as a way to just stay in the loop on like what's going on uh, among members. So those are a couple of tricks. Oh, and the last one, uh, this is like, most important. So I say, well, hold on, hold on, hold on, though. I'm excited to hear about this last one because I can hear how excited you are to talk about it. But let me get this straight. So you just subscribe through Feedly to your members' companies' blogs. So when your members publish something, whether personally or like a company announcement, you see it and it's a mechanism for you to keep up to date with what they're doing. And then I guess you just pick and choose what you share with the group as like a congratulations or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That is such a good idea. It's such a damn good idea. I'm, it's, it's always a struggle for me to know what they're actually working on. And you get discouraged sometimes And we've talked about this because there's like the natural silence in community where it doesn't mean that they're not there. And everyone, like it, was, it just happened to me yesterday. I got an, an email. Oh no, it was a Twitter message from somebody that said, Hey, I really loved your master classes. I followed this. It helped me so much. And it's, it's one of those encouraging moments of like, oh, wow, they are really working on it. But it'd be so much cooler to like have a proactive feed <laughs> of, of all this stuff that, that my members are working on. That is such a good idea. Thanks, man. Yeah, I, it helps me a lot. And um, the tricky part is updating. I'm not one of these people who's really good at like constantly keeping systems updated. Exactly. I'm sort of a hot mess when it comes to that, but yeah. um, getting better about asking for help. So like I said, we, we, we now have a VA who helps with keeping the Twitter list updated. She's fantastic. Um, and it's helped me to stay more in the loop with our members. So I think it's a really cool option. Um, the last thing which I wanted to call out is uh, other members of the team in the community so they've been huge so i've got a couple of people on my team who are in they're they're big in the vc space so they hear about raises and stuff that our members do early and they'll send those articles to me um the same thing with you know some of our more active members they share stuff so uh, i i have a lot of help basically but um those are some of the ways that i've been able to kind of do this thing of like injecting energy into the community by introducing people by sharing news from members of the community mm -hmm. and, and by like just soliciting feedback on stuff that's going on. Um, there's tools out there. And then you can also set the community up like to try and build a culture that, that self-sustains that too. So if, if the company has been in stealth, as you have kept saying, how have you been getting members? Like how have you even been selling it and promoting it just one-on-one? -on -one? Talking to people? Yeah. Yeah, for the most part. Yeah, I think it's a lot of, it's a lot of like one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, outbound. We have a handful of people there who have sort of guessed their way to it. Because, um, you know, obviously Sam is like a public personality as well. And he's, he's, he's hinted at it before without actually talking about it up to this point. So we've got some sleuths who like figured it out. 
Um, obviously, like you've seen the page, like people people know how to find it if they want to. But yeah, mostly mostly outbound. Um, and then I think like I mentioned, we're we're just kind of kicking content into gear too, and that's been the exciting part for me personally because I wasn't around when the hustle started, so I don't I never really got to see like what it's like to start something with Sam. By the time I got there, you know, he'd already hired a CEO. He was around, but he wasn't like actively involved in what I was doing on a daily basis. So it's been really cool to just kind of work with him on like, what is the early version of the newsletter look like? What are the goals for like the blog and stuff like that? All of that is just, well, we've been running the newsletter now for six months, but it's, it's internal. The rest of the public stuff is just kind of coming to fruition. And so it's been kind of cool to see like what some of the decision looks like there. So like, I'll give you an example. On the newsletter, we were just talking about community. How do you use your media to uh, reinforce this thing that you're trying to do in the community? And the biggest concept for us on that so far has been um, that we use the newsletter to drive people back into the group. And it's a pretty simple concept. You basically like pull all the most interesting stuff that happens in the group, summarize it in the newsletter, send it to everybody and make sure there's plenty of links in there. Mm -hmm. But the real secret to it, and this is what he told me like the, basically the first day that I was kind of starting to absorb all the content coming on to help write the newsletter. Um, he says like, you know, this think of this as like the high school yearbook or high school, like the high school newspaper. You basically want like as many names as possible in the newsletter. This is something that you and I have talked about before a couple of times, which is yeah. like the, people love to see their name and they love to see the names of people that they know mm -hmm. um, and a whole bunch of really successful media companies have leaned on this uh i actually asked sam recently where he heard about this and it's kind of a funny story uh hang on a second i got a link right here okay have you ever heard of the city of dunn north carolina no neither had i <laughs> but it turns out it's a small town 40 miles south of Raleigh, 14,000 residents, and they've got one of the highest um, like penetration newspapers, I think the highest in the country. The Basically, the reach of their city newspaper, Dunn, North Carolina, is 112%. Wow. Yeah, basically everybody there reads it, and people outside of the city read it too. And the reason is the, uh, the founder of the newspaper was really big on local news and specifically local names. There's an article here. I'll read a quick quote, and I'll, I'll tell people kind of how, like, how this wraps into the tech media game in a second. But here's a quick quote. So the Dunn Daily Record was founded in 1950 by Hoover Adams. Throughout his tenure as publisher, Adams believed newspapers should be relentlessly local in their coverage. In fact, asked why the Daily Record had been so successful, he replied, it's because of three things, names, names, and names. In 1978, <laughs> frustrated by what he felt was an insufficient focus on local issues in the paper, he wrote a memo to his staff explaining his views. And he said, a local paper can never get enough local names. I'd happily hire two more typesetters and add two more pages in every edition if we had enough names to fill them up. And so that has really been one of the driving uh, philosophies behind the content strategy so far for us too. So we, 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 our members are really busy um, trying to figure out like kind of how do you create something that they want to open, want to read and we're still answering that, but in, in a lot of ways, it's it's the names. We mm -hmm. want to make sure people are recognized for what they're doing in the community. Uh, just joinhampton.com. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think the blog will be live by the time this goes out, too, so people can check out some of the uh, articles that are up there, too. But you'll see, it's just really, it's it's a lot of community-focused content. And I think there's a lot of ways people can, focus, can do this, too, in their own thing. So, I mean, the names is like an easy one, right? You just look for every opportunity to mention somebody who did something. So, like, here's an example. Let's say you have some members of your community together to for dinner and you want to post a photo in the newsletter. Great. Mention everybody's name too. Or like if you say there's a really cool conversation going on in the in the community and you want to link to it in the newsletter, great. Do that and then mention and then who mention started the conversation. Name. Yep. And so everybody who's wow. waiting on it. It's just simple stuff like that, but it, it makes yeah. a big difference over time. It over time. It's definitely, it's a compounding fact for sure. It's a compounding factor for sure, because 
the value of doing that consistently over a long period of time is, is, I mean, that's the difference between people coming in for a month and a half and people staying for two years. And it's like every single one of those little at enters at enters feels tedious and it's hard to get like a direct measurement from that. But there's, there's, there's no question that it's one of those like parabolic effects. Definitely. That actually, that actually reminds me, I have a question that I want to ask you about how you do some of this stuff. So we are early, right? And that's, like I said, that's one of the reasons it's been exciting for me. Something that we're still kind of talking about is like, what should the voice of this publication be, especially as we start having more and more of a public facing uh, aspect to it? I'm curious how you think about this with clients when you're kind of starting the SEO journey with them. Do you ever talk to them about voice? Not well, no. Well, yeah, I have an answer to it. Um, when it comes to Stasi clients, not a whole lot because the voice by nature of the industry and also by nature of Google has to be very clinical. So I, I won't harp on this because it's not really the answer to your question, but one of the ranking factors in Google when it comes to what they call your money, your life content, so like finance, health, law, is E. AT. And we talked about this with the, uh, the AI content chat. They added another E, which is experience, but it's expertise, authority, and trust. And which basically means you can't just write stuff medically and Google's going to be like, oh, this fits all of the algorithms. Like there has to be signals that it's written by a person who knows what the hell they're talking about. That person who knows what the hell they're talking about is trusted by other people. And that person who knows what the hell they're talking about that is trusted by other people belongs to an authoritative type network, you know? So it's very difficult to get around that. But when it comes to the voice that I've developed for copy blogger, I decided through experience that people always gravitate like so much more towards this voice than anything else, which is the share my experience, not my advice. So even the presentations that I put together, the articles that I write, it's all like, this is what I went through. This is what happened to me. This is what I learned. And that voice has been by far the, the most effective. It, it does two things for me. One, I think it gives a, a level of vulnerability that people relate to because the internet is just so far, so full of experts. And that's just kind of annoying. Um, but also it makes it so that the writing style itself isn't as important because I can basically just write like I talk. And that is always the dream of a good writer. Like, how do you write like you talk? And it just kind of naturally solved those two problems for me where I, what am I saying? And then I just like say it and write it and it's my experience. And so there's no arguing it. And it's worked really well for me. I can't say that that's something that like I had an epiphany I just kind of got frustrated with trying to be a good writer, you know, <laughs> and I said, like, this is what I went through. And so I'm just going to write it. And it's, it's, it worked out. I like that a lot. I think that's going to be especially helpful as AI comes into the scene even more. Like we, we did touch on the whole experience thing in an early AI episode. What's crazy is that since then, these systems have only just gotten like, many, many, many times better than I think even we would have predicted back then, which wasn't that long ago. Um, But this ability to speak from personal experience, I think is going to be one of the major differentiating factors there. Yeah, it's the differentiating factor. And also, I will say on this note here, when you showed me the website, um, the copy uses like a, a pretty traditional define, agitate, solve method. And it just spoke to me because the line is starting a company is lonely. That's the define. And then agitate, you have to make difficult decisions every day with imperfect information on problems you'll likely never face before. It's daunting. In our experience, the best way to overcome the challenges is to learn from the wins and mistakes of others and to surround yourself with founders who've been there, done that. And man, like it's, it's a, it's a standard copy structure, define, agitate, solve. But 
even in your agitate and well in the in the solve section it starts with in our experience because that's mm. really what you guys are selling here the problem is that being a founder is lonely and it sounds like a high class problem and, and I, I suppose it is but man like it's it's not like it looks like in the movies i spend the majority of my time by myself trying to make decisions that nobody else can relate to and a lot of weight is is on the decisions like there's there's serious consequences of the decisions that i make and like i don't want to say it sucks because my life is great and like i wouldn't have it any other way but it's a thing it's definitely a thing and so starting a company is lonely as soon as i read that it like it just appealed to me right away and then as your your solution is in our experience the best way to overcome the challenges is to learn from the wins and mistakes of others I just think that's like a perfect, a perfect setup to make the tone and the voice based around your experience, but other people's experiences as well. Cause that's, that's what you're selling. That is the whole thing. Yeah. I like that a lot, man. I'm, I'm trying to think about ways that that might apply to other people who are listening to this. Uh, I didn't personally write that copy and I feel like one of the reasons it is successful is because it, it like it mostly came from the founders, which are Joe and Sam, and they're both multi-time founders in their own right. So they like they really can relate to, I think, the issue that a lot of people go through inside of our community. Um, and so maybe that's kind of the takeaway is like whatever community you're building, you really gotta dig into what your own pain point was and be honest and vulnerable about it in order to find that thing that's going to connect to people on the homepage and like really grab them because there there's there is like a temptation to go the other way with it too and be like you know uh whatever this community is where the best founders uh yeah. like scale their businesses or whatever and that temptation exists but I think when people hit that, it's not that they don't relate. It's just like, well, there's a lot more options out there for that. Everybody wants to be that community. You exactly. Know? So if you lead with vulnerability, then you can kind of grab them on the thing that nobody else is talking to them about. And then maybe that just gives it like opens the door a little bit. And again, I'm trying to find ways that that relates to other people listening to this. I think, I think maybe that's it. Vulnerability opens the door for you to kind of get the rest of your message across. Totally um powerful man that's like a really powerful statement and especially because it's it's the only thing that is that matters really as the ai stuff continues to compound and compound in its effectiveness like the only thing that you have that can't be um uh, commoditized is you <laughs> like that's that's all you got <laughs> so <That's it>. yeah. <laughs> This, you're actually making me think too. This is helping with some of the questions we're answering around what the voice should be. I mean, copy is one thing. I think for the editorial voice, you know, the kind of the tricky thing is like there's a feeling that editorially we want to elevate, we want to elevate the voice above what we were doing at the hustle and trends. It's not millennial humor. I hear right. what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Which is kind of weird because I think tied up in that is like this realization that all of us are just older than we were when we started those companies, like all at different points in our lives. Um, so the voice has got to be a little bit elevated. And I think I'm thinking through that. And the way that I'm doing that is like, here's the thing for me as a content guy, I'm thinking okay, we want to elevate the voice, but we don't want to disappear into the sea of people who are trying to write elevated content or who are writing elevated content, right? Like there's already Bloomberg's and McKinsey's and the New Yorker. And like, there's, there's a lot of really great stuff out there. So how do you continue to write that? Or how do you um, almost like draw from their influence while still maintaining something that's going to make you stand out? 
And the way that we've kind of been approaching this so far, and it's it's not this neat in real life. Like in real life, what it looks like is we're just going back and forth on a lot of ideas as we edit yeah. content and trying to figure out what sounds good, what sounds right. But if I was to kind of extrapolate up one level and be like, what are we really doing here? I'd say there's two things that we're trying to do. One is we're 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 looking for voices that we like, right? And so people who are listening to this and who are thinking of starting publishing, you could probably use this as a framework to think through it. You need samples of stuff that you like in order to be like, this is kind of what we're aiming for. But then you also need to be able to say, this is what I think is missing from the environment. Because you're not, like we say this all the time here, you're never going to out morning brew, morning brew. You're never going to out hustle the hustle. Like at those, at this point, those audiences, they already get that from somebody. So you got to be able to point to, hey, we like this influence, but here's what I wish somebody was saying. And what you're helping me see now is like, I think we like the elevated voice of a slightly more mature founder who's still tech savvy and driven and all this kind of stuff, maybe doesn't quite fit in with whatever the mainstream uh, like flow of businesses, but is, you know, at a, a point in their lives where they're successful and they're not, they're not looking for millennial humor, like you, like you said. Um, so we like that elevated voice. And the differentiator is the vulnerability, I think. Yeah. Because it's like... I love you, it. Yeah. Yeah, you're helping me think through this. So I think that's that. That's definitely something that we're working on. And then the last thing, and I'll leave this as like a cliffhanger, because we'll, I think we'll have more to talk about either next week or very soon, is related to monetizing via ads. This is actually something that we did not expect. But I, I was uh, just having a conversation today and there's a lot of interest around this we're kind of noticing right out of the gate. And so we're starting to have to think through, is this something that we want to do? And if so, how do you approach that? I mean, it's still a very small newsletter, right? But that doesn't mean, like we've said this before, the size of the list is actually not as important as other factors when you're monetizing ads. So I'm starting to put feelers out. I'm starting to explore this area. And I think in a couple of weeks, we'll have something to talk about here. I'll be able to kind of sh shine a light on how this works for brand new publications for people. Cool. I'm excited to what you are going to bring to the table with that. I, my head goes to webinars, charge top dollar to give companies access to like a presentation that they would give to your members that's and i have no idea if that's relevant by the way that's just the absolute first thing that popped in my head like how much is an ad worth to a newsletter of i mean i don't know i'll just say a thousand people as opposed to how much is like a 30 minute presentation with like a, a heavy cta discount code at the end of it worth when you're selling a product that's 10 grand a year or some shit like that right yeah, it could work. Something like that. Yeah, we have this really like, well, I'll, maybe I'll talk through a little bit of it now for people yeah, save, who are- Yeah, talk through some of it, but I, save most of it. I wanna yeah. I wanna hear like where this goes. I'll, I'll tie one thing back into the community aspect because we spent so much time there. The one thing that's top of mind for any kind of like sponsorship or ad strategy is the community has got to come first, right? So like we have a lot of successful founders in the group. Um. They're worth a lot of money to a lot of people. You could kill that golden goose. Anybody could screw that up, right? Totally. Uh, that is not like the pretty much the most important thing is that you don't screw that up. So for us, the way I'm kind of thinking about it now is like, and this is a this is a strategy that's sort of taken directly from the days of the hustle. The philosophy there was everybody wins when the reader comes first because if you select advertisers based on who your readers are really going to love, who they're going to enjoy, you talk to them in a way that they like being talked to, what you're going to have is a bunch of people who they click more, they buy more. So your advertisers are more happy. Your readers are more happy. Your advertisers buy again. It all starts with the audience. You can't let that go. There can never be a situation where you grab for the money because it's too tempting and just kind of like farm your audience's attention out. As soon as you do that, you lose. So 
you and I have talked about this a lot on the podcast in terms of who we're thinking of working with for sponsors here. I think it goes for the podcast, it goes for communities, it goes for newsletters, all of that. Totally. So yeah, happy to dig into this more as we um, explore that strategy over there. But it's definitely interesting to kind of be in the mix as it first starts. That's fun. I'm excited for you. It's a fun journey. It sounds like it's something that like is is uh, is is new to you, and it is the most adrenaline rushed part. Like it's it's a terrible thing that happens where once you succeed, it's like it loses the magic a bit. Even though the whole entire time the goal was to succeed, where like the, the adrenaline comes from the new thing, right? So I'm, I'm really excited for you, man. It's gonna be a blast. And plus, you guys are gonna kill it. You're gonna thanks, kill man. It. Yeah, appreciate it. Yeah. Um. Well, this was awesome. I appreciate. Yeah, great. yeah love kind of hashing these things out with you. Uh, for everybody listening, thanks for checking out the podcast. Don't forget to check out copybloggerpod.com where you can find all the resources, access to our email list, everything else. And should I shout out our sponsor one more time? <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> no, that's, that's not yet. Leave um, that in, Isaac. <laughs> no. We yeah. just have like, it's like a Mad Lib, but for sponsors, it's like, and thank you to our sponsor, Blank, blank. who helps with yeah, Blank. blank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyways, thanks a lot, everybody. We'll see you next week. See you guys.